Welcome to Gospel Truth with Andrew Womack, a teaching ministry that focuses on God's unconditional love and grace, celebrating 20 years of discipling others through Karis Bible College worldwide. And now, here's Andrew. Welcome to our Friday's broadcast of the Gospel Truth. Today is the end of my second week to be teaching on the effects of praise. I've got a book on this entitled The Effects of Praise. I've got CDs, DVDs, and we've also been offering our praise and worship from our Karis Bible College. And I tell you, this is powerful. We have just, I've really enjoyed the praise and worship. And uh, I've mentioned this one time before, but we do live stream the praise and worship from Karis Bible College every Monday and Wednesday morning from 8 o'clock until 8.50. Of course, that's Colorado time. And you can go on our website and watch that. But this CD and DVD is just really powerful, and the teaching on all of this is powerful. Uh, What I'm talking about is how praise affects you, and then how praise affects the devil, and then how praise affects God. Very few people understand how praise affects God. Some people understand that praise affects you and it makes you positive instead of negative and it's a good thing for you. And I taught a lot of things about how it makes your faith abound and so many other things. Uh, A few more, maybe a few less people understand how praise affects the devil, but according to Matthew chapter 21 compared with Psalms chapter 8, praise is strength to still the enemy and the avenger. And it just literally stops Satan in his tracks. He hates praise. And this is my own personal opinion. I believe it's accurate, but I think this is why we have the tradition of praising God when we come together and we start with praise and worship. Of course, the scripture says in Psalms 100 verse 4, it says, enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. So we were admonished in Scripture to do it. But I think that the reason that the Lord set this up is because when you come together, if you just came together and then people just started talking and somebody preaching or something like that, uh, it would have been easy for you to just transpose all of your problems of the day and stuff and start talking about them. But when you start praising God, it makes you lay aside all of these things and forget yourself and start praising God for who He is and for His goodness. It brings the supernatural manifestation of God's presence. I've quoted this scripture many times over in Psalms chapter 22, that God inhabits the praises of His people. So it affects your heart. It takes your attention off of the negative and start praising God. It draws the supernatural power of God. It drives away demons. Satan cannot stand praise. And so it's just powerful. It affects all three of these areas. It affects your heart. It affects the devil. It affects God. And it prepares all of these things. And then when you come time to minister the word or to start praying for people, the whole atmosphere of everything has been changed. And so I believe that that's the reason that the church, of course, they do it because we were instructed to do it in scripture. But I believe that that's the practical reason that God gave us that is because it affects you. It affects the devil. It affects God. And it is just the way that we are supposed to relate to God. I can't imagine having a relationship with God that isn't centered around praise. And I hadn't taught on this. I'll probably teach on this more next week as we get into talking about how praise affects God. But just my own personal life, I couldn't tell you the exact percentage. I've never sat down and done this technically, but it seems to me that 90% or more of all of my prayer life and relationship with God is built around praise and thanksgiving. I mean, that's what it centers around. Stop and think about this. What did Adam and Eve have? What was their relationship with God like? I know some of you have never sat down and thought about this, but you know, they didn't have anybody to intercede for. They didn't have to pray and ask God to save anybody. They didn't have to pray over the government and pray that, you know, righteousness would exalt a nation. They didn't have any needs to pray for. They didn't have to pray for their daily bread. God had created so much fruit and everything. I mean, it was just, it was such a super abundance. They didn't have to pray for their needs to be met. They didn't need any clothes. They didn't have cars. They didn't have houses. They didn't have anything that they needed. They didn't ask God for something and they didn't have to repent of sin before they had entered into eating of the forbidden fruit. 
They didn't have sin to repent of. They didn't have bad memories to repent of. They didn't have to get over their terrible childhood and being abused. I mean, what did Adam and Eve do to have a relationship with God? Think about that. And yet it says that God talked to them in the cool of the evening. What did they talk about? They weren't asking forgiveness. They weren't interceding. They weren't begging for something. They weren't rebuking. They didn't have the devil to bind. I believe that Adam and Eve basically were just fellowshipping with God. They were just saying thank you. Saying, Father, thank you for a beautiful sunrise. Thank you for the sunset. Thank you for, I saw this tree today. I saw these animals. Thank you for just a beautiful world. I believe the Lord was probably asking them, what did you to do, do today? And they were talking about where they went and what they did. And it was just praise. It was worship. It was thanksgiving and just talking about things. And you know what? I believe that, that our relationship with the Lord, if it was more like that, if it was more just fellowship with the Lord and thanking Him and loving Him, we wouldn't have as many problems. We wouldn't have to ask for as much. But the average person doesn't really commune with God and fellowship with God. What they do is they use God like a grocery cart to go down the aisles of heaven and say, give, give me this and give me this. And they're just constantly asking for stuff. And if that's what your relationship with God is about, that's one of the reasons that you have so many problems is because you don't use prayer to fellowship with God, to worship God, to bless Him and to minister unto Him. I'll be focusing on that a lot more next week. In 1 Timothy chapter 6, I wanted to read these verses to you. And um, this is going to rattle some of you because again, we have values that are so different than what are expressed in the Bible. And um, most people just don't let the Bible get in the way of what they believe. But I want to let you or encourage you to think about this. This could radically change the way that you look at things. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 1, he says, Let as many servants as are under the yoke count their own masters worthy of all honor that the name of God and His doctrine be not blasphemed. Now the wording here is Old English. It's not real straightforward to the way we would say things today, but what he's talking about here is slavery. And he's talking about people who are slaves to count their masters worthy of all honor. In other words, he's saying, don't be bitter because you're a slave, but honor your masters. And somebody would say, well, what if they were a Christian? And I'm a Christian and there is no, you know, Paul said that in Christ there is neither bond nor free or any of these kind of things. In other words, in Christ, all of this slavery is done away with. And people might say, well, if you're a Christian, you shouldn't have slaves. You shouldn't own me. Look at the next verse. It says, and they that have believing masters, let them not despise them because they are brethren, but rather do them service because they are faithful and beloved, partakers of the benefit. These things teach and exhort. Now, let me say what I'm not saying. I've mentioned this before, and I've had people who've been partners with me for a long time write in and say that I support slavery and I think we ought to have slaves. I am not saying that. And if you write in and try and tell me that and tell me that I'm promoting slavery, I'm not even going to honor your uh, letter by responding to it. That is just foolishness. I am not for slavery. I could turn to other scriptures and show you where it was forbidden and things like this. I am not promoting slavery. But here's the point I'm trying to get across. Paul lived in a day where slavery was the rule of the day. And how did he deal with it? This didn't mean that you were just to accept it, that you weren't supposed to pray that people would be delivered from this bondage. But Paul was telling these people that you still can be praising God. You still can show the love of God. You can pray for your masters. You can serve them. And he said, if you have a believing master, then instead of demanding that they let you go because you are both free in the Lord... Instead, you should just serve them and give them even more honor. Now, again, this is not saying that Paul wanted slavery, that I want slavery. I don't believe it's a godly thing. But what this is saying is that there's some things more important than just your physical freedom. And I know that this is going to really ruffle the feathers of people. But if you looked at things from God's standpoint, there are people who are slaves 
who are freer than people who aren't slaves. Or here's another comparison. I just saw this on television just recently. I turned on a Christian broadcast and there was a guy on there talking about how he had been in prison and in prison he had the gospel shared with him and he got born again. And I mean, this guy was just telling that he was freer than he had ever been in his life. He said he had to get put behind bars to find out what freedom is. And he was saying that he was happier and freer than he had ever been in his life. He had never known freedom like when he was in prison. Now, is this encouraging that everybody ought to go into prison to find freedom? No, you can find freedom without being in prison. But it is saying that whether you are in jail or out of jail, the most important thing is your personal relationship with God. And if you experience the freedom that is in Christ, it's the same as if you're free. And I've, I've heard this not only from this guy on television, but I've had many people write in to me who got hold of the Word through my teaching and they were just free and they are happier than they have ever been in their life even though they're locked up in prison. So this is the point that Paul's making. He is not promoting slavery. I'm not promoting slavery, but what he is saying is that you can still praise God. You can still operate in love. You can still worship God. In other words, slavery is not a reason for you to be defeated and beat down and oppressed. The book of Philemon was written to Philemon, who was a slave owner. He was a Christian, and one of his slaves, Onesimus, had escaped and he made it all the way to Rome. And in Rome, he connected with Paul. Paul and Philemon were uh, friends. Paul had been in Philemon's home and Paul and Onesimus met each other in Rome. Paul shared with Onesimus and Onesimus got born again. And did you know Onesimus could have stayed in Rome and have stayed in freedom and yet Paul told him to go back to his master Philemon and submit himself and wrote the book of Philemon and sent it by the hands of a slave, a runaway slave, and sent it back to his master. Now again, is this promoting slavery? No, I praise God that slavery is over. There was terrible things done under slavery. I am not for slavery, but I am saying that there are some things more important than whether you are slave or free, whether you're in prison or not in prison. And the most important thing is your personal relationship with the Lord. And so he says in verse 3, after saying these things about slavery, he says, If any man teach otherwise and consent not to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to the doctrine which is according to godliness, he is proud, knowing nothing, but doting about question. That word doting means an unjust or an undue focus on these things. So they are focused on questions and strife of words, whereof cometh envy, strife, railings evil surmisings, perverse disputings of men of corrupt minds and destitute of the truth, supposing that gain is godliness from such withdraw thyself. Boy, these are some major statements right here. And again, this is not promoting slavery, but it's saying that if a person is putting freedom ahead of everything else, ahead of your personal relationship with God, ahead of what Jesus has done for you, then you are out of balance. You are focused on things. You are thinking that personal gain, you succeeding, you being prosperous is what it's all about. That's what he's talking about. Supposing that gain is godliness. And he says, from such withdraw yourself. Again, I am not promoting slavery. I am not promoting any of these negative things. I praise God for our freedom, but I am saying that our freedom and our liberty, our personal relationship with God far su surpasses everything else. And see, if you got this attitude, then even if you're in a bad job, even if you're in a bad marriage, even if you're in a bad neighborhood, if you're in under certain circumstances where you don't have the education and you could just use a million things to put into this context, you could still be praising God. You could still be loving God. And I tell you this, history bears this out a hundred thousand times over. I've read stories about people who were slaves, who were freer than their descendants today who are free. 
free in the natural, but bound spiritually, bound in their heart and in their emotions, bound to drugs and alcohol and bitterness and anger and an entitlement mentality and stuff like that. Again, am I saying that, for, that slavery is a good thing? No, but I am saying that there are things that are more important than your physical circumstances, the size of the house that you live in and all of this other stuff. And if you got this attitude that this is promoting, then even if you were in slavery, even if you were in poverty, even if you didn't have everything going, if your marriage wasn't working right and on and on, you could still be praising God. And that's what it's talking about. Some people think that godliness is just getting as much as you can and then canning all you get and then sitting on your can and just accumulating everything you can get materially, emotionally, awards, all of these kind of things. This is saying that, man, you need to withdraw yourself from that. And then the next verse says, but godliness with contentment is great gain. Godliness is the focus. Relationship with God is the focus. Did you know Adam and Eve didn't have fancy houses, clothes, cars, uh, jewelry, all of the stuff that we talk about today, and yet they were in paradise. They were in perfection. They were communion with God every day. And that's the way that God made us to be. According to Revelation chapter 4, verse 11, it says, For His pleasure everything was and is created. That means that the original purpose of Adam and Eve was for God's pleasure. And today, our reason for our existence is still for His pleasure. And that's what we need to be focused on. Godliness with contentment is great gain. But having just gain, having a nice house, all of these things without God, without being thankful, if you aren't thankful, if you aren't worshiping and praising God, you're missing what it's all about. I've met many people who are happier than people with all of these other advantages, and yet in the natural, they just suffered. I remember this one couple that I went to in Cluj-Napoca, Transylvania, Romania. And this is back during the uh, Berlin Wall when it was still up, when communism was ruling. And these people were the ones that had smuggled Bibles in. And the person who was my contact between me and them, they had never met each other. They just left notes out in the... Uh, forest and they had drop spots and they exchanged things and they knew each other by code names. And then when the uh, Berlin Wall came down and Romania overthrew Ceausescu, they killed him. And for I went over there right after the month after Ceausescu, however you say his name, Ceausescu was killed. I was over there and uh, I mean, it was just totally free. They didn't have any laws. The government had been overthrown and nobody knew what you could or couldn't do. And it was amazing. And anyway, we brought 10,000 Bibles with us. And because of the change in the government, the guy who was my friend and the one who had been in contact with them, we met for the very first time. Prior to that, it had just been code names and, and things out in the forest. We met with them and we got to go into their house. And this couple had built their own home. It was nice. It wasn't, you know, real fancy or anything by American standards, but it was nice. And the reason they built it is because Ceausescu had bugged everything. Everything that was built in Romania was bugged by him. And so to be able to escape this, they built their own house and did it themselves so that they could guarantee that there was no fiber optics or listening devices and all of these kind of things. And anyway, we went into their home and we got to visiting and uh, talking and they had been very prominent. They were very well educated. They had both been professors in the uh, university. But when they became Christians, they got totally blackballed. They had their jobs taken away from them. They were demoted. They were put down to a very low level thing. The man had been put in prison and had been beaten many times they, uh, their daughter, they had a daughter that all of the Communist Party leaders had taken the daughter and made fun of her because her parents were a Christian because she was a Christian and they mocked her and beat her and did things like this. The government had taken away their rations. They weren't able to get gas. They had turned off their electricity during the winter and in Romania, it gets cold. And they actually told us stories that they had ice an inch thick on the ceiling, the walls, the floor. They went through an entire winter 
with no heat. They actually took the battery out of their car since they couldn't get any gas. The Communist Party wouldn't allow them to have any gas rations because they were Christian. And they took the battery out of their car and used it to power one light bulb is all they had. And their daughter used that to study so that she could pass her grades in school. And they just had all of these terrible, terrible things going on. And it had been that way for decades. And the man who was the contact with them, he asked him, he says, why didn't you ever accept our offers to get out of Romania and to come to the United States? We had people that would have sponsored you and you could have gotten asylum in the United States. And he says, why didn't you ever take any of my offers? And I never will forget this woman. She said, you Americans... She says, you think we have to have a fancy house and heat and all of these kind of things. She says, why do I have to have that to be happy? She says, I'm happy right where I am. This is where I was born. These are my people. She says, if we left here, who is going to share with them about Jesus? And this woman was just so happy and so content. We brought them one slice of sausage and two Uh, sticks of cheese and the woman broke down crying. That was over a year's worth of cheese and sausage that they got. And yet in all of these deplorable situations, she says, I'm happy. Why would I want to go anywhere else? She says, I am just totally satisfied, totally content. And I tell you, it was a real lesson to me. This is what this is saying. It says, godliness with contentment is great gain for we brought nothing into the world And it is certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and raiment, let us be there with content. Now, this doesn't mean that we aren't supposed to dream for something big in order to be able to affect other people and to be a blessing. But I'm saying that you should be content. You shouldn't be striving for increase because you have to have that to be happy. And I'm telling you, there's millions of people watching me right now that your whole life you are stretching yourself, you are working extra hours, you're doing all of these things, but it is not because you want to be a blessing. It's because you've got to have these things to be content. You just need to learn to be content with what you have. If you have food and raiment, be content. You know, I live in a house. I love where I live. If I had millions of dollars, I wouldn't live someplace else. But I built my house in 1988 for $60,000, which, you know, depending on where you are in the world, that may sound like a huge amount of money, but relative to everybody I know, nearly everybody I know has a house that's bigger than mine, better than mine. And I could now go get something better, but I'm content. We've customized that. I've got it exactly the way I want it. I don't have to live in a fancy place. I'm not against people who do. You can live wherever you want to, but I'm just saying, how many bathrooms do you have to have to take care of your business? How many beds can you sleep in at one time? You know what? Sooner or later, we need to find our contentment. And the point I'm getting at through all of this is we just need to be thankful and praise God for what we have and quit all the time waiting and lusting for something else. Praise God that things are as good as they are. I'm going to continue to teach on this next week. This is my book entitled The Effects of Praise. And I think that this would really be a blessing to you. I've also got it in CD and in DVD form. And then we're also offering our praise and worship CD and DVD from Karis Bible College. It is just powerful, powerful praise and worship. So listen to our announcer and please call or write today. Andrew's complete teaching series titled The Effects of Praise is available on either CD or DVD as seen on our daily TV program. Or you can get this teaching in book form. Each is available for a gift of any amount. This entire series is also available for audio download absolutely free from our website. During this teaching series, we're also offering the most recent release from Karis Bible College Worship Ministry. The Best is Yet to Come features 14 tracks recorded live with the entire student body, including original songs written by Karis Bible College School of Worship students. You can get it on CD or on a DVD that includes lyrics you can use at your church or Bible study. Each is available for a gift of any amount. Go to awmi.net and click on Today's TV Offer to see all the ways you can get the products offered on today's program. 
The second audio teaching in today's series is titled, The Effect of Praise on the Devil. It's available for a gift of any amount when you write or call. We encourage everyone to give, but if you're simply unable to afford it, Andrew and his partners will provide this second CD free of charge. This is the last day we'll be offering this teaching, so be sure to respond today. You can use your credit card to order resources through our website at awmi.net. While you're there, you can discover more product details and download additional free resources. Or you can order through our helpline Monday through Friday from 4.30 a.m. to 9.30 p.m. Mountain Time. Our helpline number is 719-635-1111. If the lines are busy, remember, you can order ministry materials 24 hours a day, 7 days a week at awmi.net. To write us, use the address on your screen. We appreciate your generosity and hope to hear from you today. Through you, I can do anything. I can do all things. Cause it's you who gives me strength Nothing is impossible Through you, blind eyes are opened Strongholds are broken I am living by faith Nothing is impossible The Lord has blessed us in many, many ways But I tell you, one of the most exciting things is the praise and worship that we have at our Karis Bible College It is second to none Is yet to come. And we now have put out a CD and a DVD, and the title of this CD is The Best Is Yet to Come. That's a saying of mine, and Daniel Amstutz, who is the music praise and worship leader as well as the head of our worship uh, school in the third year, uh, wrote a song about that, The Best Is Yet to Come. This is powerful, and I just wanted to advertise this to you and let you know about it. Uh, They are tremendous. I tell you, if you would get these, you would not be disappointed. It would help you to get into the presence of the Lord and worship Him in spirit and in truth. So check this out. The best is yet to come. I'd like to invite you to come and spend a great week with us in Colorado at our new facilities in Woodland Park. On June the 29th through July the 3rd, we're going to have our Summer Family Bible Conference. And we call it that because not only do we have ministry to the adults, but we have children and youth ministry. It's a great time. And it's just a full week. We have morning and evening sessions. In the morning, primarily, it's our Bible college instructors ministering. I'm ministering every evening. And it's just going to be a great time at our beautiful new facility in Woodland Park. So remember, it's June the 29th through July the 3rd, right here at our facilities in Woodland Park, Colorado.